started. Um, so first of all, uh, welcome everyone, and uh, thank you so much for coming out this evening. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Stuffings. I'm the program coordinator for the San Miguel uh, Watershed Coalition, um, and I'd like to start us off this evening um, just by providing a, a quick introduction to the Forest and Flux story maps, um, and more specifically, the, the stakeholder-driven landscape assessment um, that's brought us to where we're, where we're at today. Um, so first up, the, uh, I want to interest, introduce you to the, the project team. So, uh, so I've been handling <coughs> the, um, the overall coordination um, of the stakeholder group and the landscape assessment. Um, and this evening we have with us um, Dr. Jason Seibel. He's a um, biogeographer out of um, CSU. And he and his team um, provided us with the, the GIS modeling and the optimization work for the assessment. Um, we also have Hillary Cooper, uh, San Miguel County Commissioner. <coughs> uh, it's really Hillary's efforts that got this project off the ground in the first place um, and continues to provide a valuable input during the, the whole process. Um, and we also have um, Aaron Kempel, who um, couldn't be with us this evening, but he is the, the program director with Mountain Studies Institute, um, and Aaron's helped us out with meeting facilitation and data management. <coughs> All right, so, um, so the Forest and Flux story maps that you'll be learning about this evening um, are a result of the efforts of the Upper San Miguel Basin Forest Health Landscape Assessment. And that landscape assessment, you know, once again, is that stakeholder-driven <coughs> effort um, to better understand and characterize the forest landscapes of the upper San Miguel watershed. Uh, and so the project began with the premise that you know, disturbances, so wildfire, disease, uh, beetle kill, um, have the potential to have significant impacts on our forest landscape. And so being um, aware of these processes and the potential outcomes of um, forest change uh, is incredibly beneficial to the community and specifically enabling the community to prepare um, for anticipated or projected forest type changes um, and potentially to mitigate um, the impacts of those changes. And so the, the, the landscape assessment and the, um, the forest and flux story maps are designed to be a tool for the community um, to make informed land management decisions in the future. So, so this stakeholder process has been going on <clears throat> for, for about a year now. The group first met in January of this year. Um, the stakeholder groups met five times so far. And in each of those meetings, the stakeholder group has you know, made important decisions about the direction of the landscape assessment. Um, some examples, the group um, determined the physical boundaries of this assessment. Um, they came up with a list of community values to help inform uh, the mapping process. And so, as you can see, um, we've had great engagement from the community uh, during the stakeholder process, and this group will continue to meet in the future. So if there's any interest um, in having an active voice in this conversation, we definitely invite your participation. Um, and on behalf of the, the stakeholder group and all the project partners, uh, project team, I'd like to recognize our funding partners. Um, so Telluride Mountain Village Owners Association, Telluride Ski and Golf, Town of Mountain Village, <coughs> Town of Telluride, and San Miguel County. Um, in addition to the monetary support um, each of these partners has been active in the, the stakeholder process. So, um, on tap for tonight, for tonight, uh, Hillary Cooper, she's going to talk a bit more in depth about the process of this assessment. Um, then we'll hear from Jason about um, his findings, the methodology, and we'll go through the, um, the community forest and flood story maps. And then we'll have the opportunity to talk with Jason, Hillary, 
I'm Todd Gardner from the U.S. Forest Service and Austin Shelby from the Colorado State Forest Service about potential next steps um, that the com community <coughs> might consider in the future. And time permitting, we'll have some time for uh, questions and answers. So, all right. Thank you, Elizabeth. Elizabeth has been great um, herding cats throughout this process, and um, it's it is easily a process that could have imploded on itself. It could have exploded in all different kinds of directions, as so many of us have seen here in Telluride. But um, Elizabeth and Aaron from uh, Mountain Studies Institute, I think, really kept us focused, kept us in check, and kept our meetings um, efficient. And we were able to come up with this result, um, which I think is going to be helpful for community decision makings. Um, I just would like to uh, recognize some of my fellow elected officials that are here. Chris Holstrom, County Commissioner, is here. And Todd is here, just been talking, oh, right in front of me, sorry. Todd Brown from the town of Telluride. Um, we also have um, participation from the Forest Service. Matt, oh, Joan, hi, sorry. Thank you, <laughs> I didn't see you come in. And Joe May from San Diego County. Am I, did I not see anyone else come in? Um, we also have, uh, <coughs> Excuse me, I've got funny stuff in my throat. Um, Matt from the U.S. Forest Service, Norwood District Ranger, and Todd Gardner, uh, who's silviculturist on the on the G Mug, and Austin from um, Colorado Forest Service, um, John Bennett from Telluride Fire Protection District, and Jody Reese from Colorado State Forest mm -hmm. Service. Um, and we have all sorts of other great people in the room too. Uh, I just wanted to point those people out and um, mention their participation in this process, which was really key to having a thorough um, amount of input from the region and also is going to be really key to create this ongoing um, stakeholder group and partnerships that we have to carry mm -hmm. some of these ideas forward and to carry um, anything that we do on the landscape forward. Um, so I, I just wanted to talk really briefly about um, how <coughs> we started this process and then sort of the final result. And I'm going to get let Jason get into the details of the final result. But um, I went into this thinking, I had had a lot of experience. I was following Pitkin County and their um, immensely proactive efforts towards uh, forest health in their region. Mm -hmm. They have a lot more financial resources up there. They had some landowners who basically were throwing millions of dollars towards forest health. They formed individual nonprofits around forest health. They got the Forest Service engaged. They went through a five-year planning process. Jason was involved in that process too. So I was watching that process and thought that we could do something sort of similar here on a downscale Telluride style way of doing things. Um, and simultaneously, Aaron Kimple from uh, MSI was working south of us in the Pagosa Springs area on a um, forest health stakeholder group there. And they were looking at a lot of economic incentives for, um, to, as a way to address their forest health issues. They have a lot of different species down there, but he had seen a lot of really specific um, landscape results and decisions and industry decisions that came out of that process. So as Aaron and I went into this, we both thought, well, we'll come out with, you know, an action plan and we'll have sort of five top things and, and we'll work with all these other groups and, and we'll see, you know, where on the landscape we can work, where in the landscape we don't want to work. Well, through this process, we, as we identified values, um, the Stakeholders continue to come back to this idea of it's not specific values on the landscape that we're looking at, it's the forest is what we value the most. We want to understand what is happening to our forest, and we place this very strong value on the forest itself. Of course we value the economics of recreation and our community infrastructure and um, you know, public safety and the ski area and all of those other things that we have here, but we kept sort of stepping back from that and coming back to this idea of, but ultimately it's the forest that we value the most and we want to understand what is happening with our forest, which was something that, um, as a deep ecologist, 
should not surprise me at all, but it did surprise me because I thought that with all the people in the room, we would really come up with more of an action plan. But we ended up backing off of a specific action plan and specific sort of zones on the landscape to um, create, to, to you know, direct Jason to create a map of the entire landscape and the ecology of the entire landscape. And that's what you're gonna see here, and mm -hmm. um, that we hope will be the basis of conversations moving forward. Um, and then the last point I wanna make is that we uh, unfortunately have a really big opportunity in this time with all of the uncertainty and the defunding of the federal government in Washington, D.C. to uh, shape the way that our federal and to some degree our state land managers um, treat our forests. I think they're now looking at I mean, their, their resource pool is really dwindling, so now that they're looking at getting more local involvement, more local partnerships to really inform the decision-making process moving forward. So um, we need to get involved. We have an opportunity to do that with the state. We have an opportunity to do that with each other, with Mountain Village, Town of Tyrone, and the county, um, fire district. And we have an opportunity to do that at the... Uh, larger landscape planning mm -hmm. level. Right now there is the, uh, the, uh, the Forest Service forest planning that is going on. They just um, completed a first round of deadlines on their um, assessment documents and that's the first step of launching into this entire forest planning effort. So if we're able to come up with sort of a mini forest planning effort we can you know, provide that to the Forest Service to really get what we want, <coughs> we need, and what we believe our forests need out of that bigger landscape effort. So thank you all for being here. And um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jason. I met Jason and first heard him talk like five or six years ago. And um, as a side note, Jason actually inspired me on a new sort of sideline career I have of documenting scientists who are excellent storytellers who I feel should get out to the world and especially in the classrooms. So Jason was an inspiration for that little project I have going on and I like to get him as in front of as many audiences as possible and working with as many groups as possible. And um, he is a real, he has been a real partner in this effort to the tune of um, thousands and thousands of dollars in in-kind contribution because this really was a pilot project and Jason wanted to see uh, as much as we wanted to see how to best implement this. So we welcome your feedback and certainly thank Jason for all of his time and perseverance with us through this first step. Thanks, Thanks for coming. Thanks so much for the opportunity to work with you guys. Yeah, I think it was probably five years ago that uh, I was here. We were talking about spruce beetle and how we respond to spruce beetle and why the spruce beetle outbreak was coming <coughs> up. And um, you know, as a scientist, it's great, you know it's my dream to find a receptive community and audience who are um, interested, and proactive, and want to apply things. Um, I think, you know, hiding away in an office and doing uh, scientific work is great and very important, um, but working with communities is, is very fulfilling and uh, hopefully we can move forward and help you guys understand your landscape. I think, you know, so kind of piggybacking on, on some of what Hillary said, um, I've worked with Pitkin County, we've done some prescribed fires, we've done some um, patch cuts, we've done all kinds of things there, um, and it's been really exciting. They've really embrace this idea of treating these these treatments as experiments and learning from them um, but they were very much when the mountain pine beetle outbreak first occurred in the in the early 2000s they had a very much of a command control let's modify our landscape let's take hold of this let's act let's burn let's cut let's do things um, and interestingly enough 
Uh, right now, they're wanting to take a step back and maybe go more towards this direction of saying, what do we have? What, what's, what is, you know, so I met with their county commissioners this summer, um, and they said, yeah, okay, we burned this patch, you know, what does it mean? It's, it's been a successful project. What about our broader landscape? Should we have burned this patch? Should we burn other patches? If so, where? What's the kind of bigger, grander landscape view? Um, so interestingly enough, they went with this kind of jumping in with, with two feet action-oriented um, perspective, and now they're taking a step back, and we'll probably do some um, similar types of work to this with Pitkin County this winter. Um, so there's no right or wrong. Um, this kind of it did go in a different direction than what we anticipated, but I think it's really valuable. We all have, um, given the website that I'll show you in a few minutes here, um, the same kind of base knowledge and starting point to have logical discussions um, and, and have some basis for what people are saying and thinking and um, either concerned about or not concerned about. This is what I want to do tonight. I want to talk real quick. I don't, I, the semester ended for me on Friday. I gave my last <laughs> lecture. Um, I don't want to give uh, a long lecture, but I do want to give you a little bit of background on climate and forest change in Colorado. Um, talk about kind of what we know, some of the uncertainty, where we think we're going. Look at the last 15, 16 years um, to see where that, where we think that's taking us. Um, and then show you this landscape ass assessment, and then I have one slide with some potential next steps. Although when we do the panel, I have a feeling um, that we could uh, talk about that there. Real quick, uh, in climate projections, there's a lot of uncertainty in where we're going. There are a few things that we do know that we feel pretty confident in. Um, <coughs> one is that, uh, this, this, this place on the globe that creates deserts around the world. It's called the descending limb of the Hadley cell. Right now, it's descending in northern Mexico um, and kind of creeps up into Arizona and New Mexico. Um, we know that when the world warms up, and we know this for you know millions and millions of years of climate reconstructions, when the world warms up, that descending limb moves further north and south. So we know that that descending limb of the Hadley cell, which is really important for our climate during the summertime, will start to creep into um, southern Colorado. So one thing that we do feel pretty confident about is that that will start to creep into southern Colorado um, and will likely have a drying influence on our climate. That's really big. The other big thing we know is that as the world warms up, um, the jet stream, or oftentimes what's referred to as the storm track in the wintertime that brings us precipitation in the wintertime, it starts to get pushed up further north. Over the last 100 years or so, that storm track has been residing somewhere kind of consistently between um, I-70 and the border of Colorado and Wyoming. And sure, it goes really far north sometimes, and sometimes it dips down um, over even Texas or something like that, and you get snow pretty far south. Um, but what we're anticipating is that that kind of center location of where that storm track resides that brings in moisture from the Pacific is going to move from the last 100 years kind of sitting over this area between I-70 and the border with Wyoming, that it will move further north and it will be kind of more um, positioned, normally positioned um, over the border with Wyoming as we get further into this century. So in terms of winter precipitation, yeah, it'll still make incursions into this part of the state. Um, it just might not be quite as frequent. So those are a couple of big kind of broad scale things that we know. Um, are happening or anticipated to happen. Um, and then we also have for your area, um, we have a downscaled uh, um, uh, global climate model projecting your climate um, out into the mid 2030s. Um, so this is great. Not every place on the world has this. This is downscaled. It's, it's actually looking at your local climate much more. Uh, Marcy was involved with this, so she could maybe answer any, any details. It's what the Western San Juans and the Gunnison Basin um, are included in this. This is from uh, uh, Imtiaz Ringwal Rangwala, is his last name, who's at NOAA. He's a NOAA scientist um, who did this in the last few years. I don't think it's been published yet, has it, Marcy? Uh, it's in the process of being published. Okay, it's in the process of being published, which can be a, a, a tedious process. Um, I, you know, overall, all the projections for Colorado, 
um, precipitation go, can go um, in a few different ways. Some are saying we'll get a little bit wetter, some are saying that we'll get a little bit drier. Nothing is consistent overall globally with these global climate projections. Precipitation is really challenging, um, and there are a few reasons for that, but it's really challenging. We don't have a good feel exactly how uh, precipitation will play out, although based on um, kind of that drying um, descending limb of the Hadley cell expanding further north and the storm track going further north, we would, should expect that things um, will dry out here in the San Juans. Um, temperature, <coughs> though, things agree pretty well, and this downscaled climate model um, just gives us a little more clarity on this. So by the mid-2030s, um, we're expecting seasonally amplified warming. This means that summers are going to be pro are projected to warm more than winters will warm. So summer times will become war more warm um, than winters. Um, best case scenario, by the mid-2030s, we have a two degree um, Fahrenheit increase in average temps. Um, so you have to remember that means that our average comes up. So that, that implies that a drought, a heat wave, is superimposed upon that two degrees. This is not a heat wave situation. This is the baseline. The worst case scenario of the downscaled models is a five degree Fahrenheit increase. If you were around in the year 2000, which uh, I have up here, this is the Palmer Drought Severity Index um, for, the, for June 2002. Um, we were pretty far off the charts for what people had experienced up until that point in time, although um, in the 40s and 50s there had been some pretty severe drought. These deeper reds are indicating more severe drought. So that entire spring and summer, we, were, um, we experienced a very severe drought. This was our first big year with lots of wildfires, and this initiated a lot of the bark beetle outbreaks that we still have um, going on a little bit today. <coughs> right now, the pine beetle is basically over. Um, so that's a really severe drought. If we look at the tree ring record, um, that rivals any, any of the most severe droughts that we can re reconstruct in the last 800 years. Combined with 2003, it's the driest back-to-back -back two year period that we have in the last 800 years based on tree ring reconstructions. So it's kind of a, a worst case scenario. Um, our best case scenario by the mid 30s is that we will have a 2002 type drought once per decade. Our worst case scenario in the downscale projections is that a 2002 style drought becomes our average, becomes our norm, our every year um, situation. Um, so we're looking out um, about 20 years here, not quite a few. So those are the downscale projections. Um, there is some uncertainty there. I always like to ground things um, in reality, so we'll look at reality <coughs> in, in just a minute. The implications for forests, um, ecological disturbances like wildfires and bark beetle outbreaks. This is from the eastern San Juans. Uh, this is spruce beetle outbreak um, in the eastern San Juans in the Wimanooch Wilderness. Um, we anticipate, because they're so dependent on extreme climates, and in particular drought, things like wildfires um, could become more frequent or are projected to become more frequent, um, could increase in intensity and severity, um, and could increase in extent, the areas that they're burning. And the same can go for beetles. Um, in terms of species, without, without disturbance implications, um, species have to exist within an envelope, within a range of climate conditions that they can live within, um, regenerate within, survive, etc. Um, so their op options are going to be either migrate upslope or to a cooler slope, oftentimes in mountainous areas. Um, so they're going to have to uh, migrate. They can migrate, of course, via seed. They're not going to pick up and move. Um, they can adapt. We may have uh, a lot of projections. A lot of people are anticipating that aspen will... Um, stop being this very tall, kind of upright, dense canopy kind of situation that we could get some kind of more scrubby, open aspen um, stands on the landscape. Or, of course, the third option is die. Um, hopefully this is just a, a local extinction event um, and not a, a, an entire extinction event. But locally, if they can't either migrate or adapt um, and they can't exist under those future climate conditions, they will die. Here's a little... Um, uh, schematic of how a couple, I'll talk about two species, Douglas fir and Engelman spruce, um, how they are projected um, to move and expand on the landscape, and then this will become a, a primary kind of component of this landscape assessment that we'll show you. 
So this is Douglas fir. Um, this is a pretty drought tolerant species. It's a pretty tough species. Um, this is a lot if you're uh, in town here and you're looking at the south facing slope. Um, sorry, yeah. the south facing slope, <laughs> important for geographers to be oriented. Um, any of those dead and dr dying trees that you've noticed there over the last few years, um, those are, are primarily Douglas fir that are being attacked by Douglas fir beetle. But they're on those rocky, dry, <coughs> warm sites, um, a long growing season, lots of, of moisture stress on those sites. And you know, until recently, they've been doing pretty well. Um, so they're pretty tough. They are actually anticipated to expand dramatically here in the western San Juans. Um, up through 2030, 2060, 2090. So this is a species that we would anticipate that they will expand out on the landscape. Of course, this is just based on climate. You have to also take into account um, these species have to throw their seed there. They have to produce enough seed. The seed has to get to these places. It has to germinate, survive, grow up, everything. Um, so there are a few other processes that have to occur. So this is a drought, dry, <coughs> montane zone species. Um, on the flip side, uh, if you have Engelmann spruce, which are your, your wet species um, up here on the north facing slopes above town, um, and a lot of the ski areas, Engelmann spruce mixed with subalpine fir, it is not drought tolerant, um, and it doesn't deal well with drought in this context. Um, we are anticipating, and the models are anticipating, that the range of a species like that um, will shrink. There's a lot of debate as to whether it will actually move upslope um, or if that tree line will be maintained because we don't have a lot of soil resources above um, present day tree line. Um, and above present day tree line, uh, those growing seasons will still be fairly short um, in the future, we think, with cold snaps during the growing season, which knock back. Um, species. So we have these kind of two ends of the continuum, these drought heat adapted species that are going to expand on the landscape, we believe, um, and then species that are not drought adapted that will um, be kind of constricted on the landscape. One of the big questions um, that, uh, that, that scientists are asking right now is can species migrate fast enough? Um, we know they've done it in the past. Um, this is uh, ponderosa pine. It's not showing up very well um, in, in, on this projector. It's not quite bright enough, but this is the present day. Um, we know that during the last glacial period, so 21,000 years ago, um, ponderosa pine was not up um, where it is right now in a lot of the Rocky Mountains. So we know that ponderosa pine and all the species that you have here, in particular spruce and fir, is, is occupying a lot of sites in Colorado. Um, that were under ice 21,000 years ago. Um, their, their refugia sites were down in Texas and Arizona um, and New Mexico. So they were a long way away from here. So we know that they have the capacity at the start of the last glacial, they migrated south. At the end of the last glacial, they migrated back north. We know they have the capacity to migrate long distances. Um, and they've done it about 10, 12 times over the last couple million years. Um, which is pretty impressive. Um, the big question today is uh, the rate of change that we're anticipating is actually <coughs> faster than this. Um, and we have a lot of fragmented landscapes and some other things that are going to complicate things. So we just don't know if species will be able to, to track climate. Um, one little success story, this is from the, some of the plots we put, my lab put in this past summer from 2002 fire events. Um, and this is, uh, this is from the Hayman fire, if anybody remembers. That was kind of our big first um, shocking fire in the state. Um, all of this bright green is Aspen, and it actually has migrated upslope in the Hayman burn. Um, and we went in to test this idea of, uh, is this fire opening up the opportunity for new species to move in? And it used to be spruce and fir, and now it's all Aspen. Um, real impressive thickets of aspen in many places. Even. So this is a big question that kind of sets the stage for a lot of the work that we did. So let's look at some reality. So let's look at uh, uh, some maps of recent patterns of climate and disturbance in Colorado. We'll start in the year 2000, um, and I'll get you oriented. I have the map of Palmer Drought Severity Index right up here. Here's Colorado. Remember. Um, green means wetter than average conditions. It means a lot of moisture in the soil. 
Uh, red <coughs> or orange, the deeper they are, means more drought stress, more moisture stress for vegetation. On this broader map here, uh, we've got red, our fires. I think in, uh, in 2000, we had a few little fire events that started to get our attention. Um, this brown is mountain pine beetle. Uh, Douglas fir beetle is blue, and spruce beetle is purple. I think there's a little purple showing up up in here, um, not much in there, and a little bit in here, and a little bit popping up in the San Juans. Um, oh, sorry, that's Douglas fir beetle. Let's see, purple, here's a little purple um, down in here, and I think there's a little bit up from the uh, late 90s blow down there from Steamboat that starts to show up here. Um, just two forest cover types. Montane is this lighter green. These are uh, uh, the more drought-adapted species, ponderous pine, Douglas fir, and this darker green is uh, the subalpine. Mostly in your area, this is spruce and fir. So we'll just step through this up through the year uh, 2015 um, and see. You know, the theory is uh, we should have already seen some extreme drought conditions. I've already talked about this, um, and we should see that systems are starting to respond to the recent kind of extremes and warming that we've had. Um, over the last decade and a half or so. So this is our starting point 2000. We already have a lot going on. Uh, here we jump to 2001. Uh, we have kind of continued drought conditions here in western Colorado. Mountain pine beetle is really starting to take off. 2002 is our big first kind of uh, uh, high severity fire year. Here's the Hayman fire. Um, there's a whole complex of fires up here in the, in the Zirkle area. Um, Boulder County has a few fires. The Flat Tops have a few fires. Missionary Ridge was probably one that you would remember if you were in this area. Um, and beetles are taking off. Beetles are thermoregulated, so the warmer it is and the longer the growing season is, the faster they mature and the more beetles survive, the more trees they can attack, the faster they can expand. Um, so that 2002 summer um, really catapults mountain pine beetle forward dramatically. 2004, um, sorry, three, I didn't narrate it all. Uh, we still have continued high severity drought. Everything's expanding in 2003. Uh, 2004, not quite as bad a drought. This is probably pretty still significant though. Um, and before the year 2000, we would have um, thought that this was a pretty big event. Things are expanding more, 2005. We get a little break. We just have some uh, kind of normal conditions here. Um, spruce beetle has gotten a hold though, um, and it <coughs> already ramped up from the from the uh, drought in the early part of the of the decade here, um, and uh, it's got a foothold in the eastern San Juans, and is really taking off, um, and is very high severity. Two thousand six. Uh, we are back to drought conditions here. Um, everything is expanding in terms of beetles. 2007, not so bad. Average conditions. 2008, we're still more or less. The plains had a, had a drought that year, um, but uh, the mountains are doing much better. 2009, mountain pine beetles expanding. Spruce beetles expanding. Spruce beetles really expanding up in the northern part of the state as well. 2010, 11, 12, we have another two-year drought. 12 and 13 um, is a pretty significant drought event. Um, and this sets the stage um, for fire in the, in the <coughs> spring, summer of 13, um, where we get this large complex of fires in the eastern San Juans, burning through uh, beetle-killed forest. <laughs> so we're really seeing that uh, the that recent climate continued kind of drought here. Um, recent climate and disturbances suggest that these projections um, are not too far off. Uh, I don't have a slide of just spruce beetle for 16 um, and drought for 16, which we were not in drought, um, but spruce beetle continues its kind of um, western and northern march here. The flight from 2017, all the air detection surveys, um, haven't come out yet. So this project, uh, this landscape assessment, like Hillary was saying, we kind of kicked around, do we do, do, is this going to be an optimization? Are we going to find um, some projects that we would actively like to pursue 
Um, where does this go? Um, and we basically kind of fell back to this idea of, hey, let's get an idea of what's going on in this landscape um, and address a couple of questions. Where species might need to move in the coming decades in order to track climate. So that idea of migrate, adapt, or die, um, where do they need to move? How much change, in other words, um, should you be anticipating in your landscape? Um, and then this fire hazard assessment, um, we talked about this in a few different ways, but the general idea is if we're gonna have more fire, um, where is that of the greatest concern on the landscape for, for people, for lives, and for property? Um, and in particular, where do we um, want to be aware of that in case any treatments go forward so that you could have um, some optimization kind of effects in terms of mitigating um, issues. So we used uh, a modeling environment and geographic information systems, so GIS. Um, we used all existing data, so we didn't create any new data. We derived a lot of new data from existing data sets, but we didn't go out and create entirely new data sets. Um, the species migration, to address this first question, um, we use bioclimatic models that Jim Worrell, probably better known um, for his Aspen work here, um, we use that as a basis, and then we created some um, topoclimate kind of variables, as well as looked at those recent patterns of, of disturbance that I just showed you, um, to try and refine how we think species may uh, move and how that change may play out. Um, on the landscape. And for fire, we just used existing models of fire behavior um, that the Colorado <coughs> State Forest Service has. I need to move. We're not, I'm not going to show you next steps because we are not doing that yet. Let's see. So here is the, the, um, the website portal. If you haven't seen it, um, it has its own site, but you can get through it, get to it from the um, from the forest health page for San Miguel County. Um, there is a link right here, forest and flux story maps. I've already got it loaded over here, and so it's going to run much better. But if you want to go to the San Miguel County Forest Health page and just click on that, um, you can play with these um, and. Uh, and take a look at what we have. Um, I'm not going to go over the project. We've talked about this. Um, changing forests is the background we just talked about. We can talk about the current conditions here. So this is the first map that you would see on the website. And it gives you an idea of the forest types that we have here um, in the study area. I'm not sure how well these colors are going to come out up here, but uh, we have Aspen is kind of this brighter green. It dominates, actually. I, I, until we actually got into this process, I didn't realize how much of your landscape <coughs> was dominated by Aspen. Um, but it is a uh, fire-loving species. You had a lot of fire here in the late 1800s from uh, miners, uh, settlers, either intentionally or unintentionally. They had a lot of reasons to burn the landscape. Um, so you have a lot of Aspen here. Uh, let's see, this mixed conifer Douglas fir this is uh, the best kind of layer we have for Douglas fir. It's kind of hanging out down in this area um, and creeps up into some of these valleys here. Uh, this has other species besides Douglas fir, but Douglas fir is oftentimes dominant, I believe, in this. Um, we modeled for uh, future distributions for both aspen, Douglas fir. We did not for pinion juniper. Uh, this is down valley in these uh, lower valley sections here. Um, we would expect it to expand on the landscape, though, because it is very drought and heat tolerant. Um, ponderosa pine, which is mostly up in this area, although you do have some um, in the mixed conifer zone, um, and even a, a handful up above town here, and I think a handful scattered in here. And then, of course, spruce fir, which uh, is your other dominant forest type. Engelman spruce and subalpine fir in the higher elevations and on the ski area here. So your big dominant forest types Right now are aspen and spruce and fir. We've got a little tab that talks about disturbances right here in your local landscape um, that you can explore. We have sudden aspen decline, uh, which is all this kind of peach color in, in these areas. Uh, this is a whole host of things. We started to notice it uh, in the early 2000s. It's associated with drought. There are a handful of things going on. Aspen is a, as a species. 
um, doesn't tend to live all that long. It <coughs> tends to live to 130, 140, 150 years, and then start to kind of peter out. If a lot of your aspen, which we're assuming, uh, regenerated following the mining era, well, it's been about 130, 140, 150 years. It's probably starting to die out anyway um, and could use a little pulse of fire to help it regenerate. Um, so if you have that combined with some really high severity drought, um, those two things uh, uh, together with maybe some defoliation events, et cetera, um, are pushing aspen um, into a decline kind of scenario in a lot of these landscapes. Although I will stress that is the canopy. That's what we can see from an airplane. Um, and we don't know to understand the future of that, that stand. Um, you really need to get in there on the ground and actually look around and see if you have new aspen shoots coming up. If you have an, uh, an overstory that's dying and no regeneration, that's a very different story um, than an aspen overstory that's dying and tons of regeneration. Um, there's also aspen defoliation here uh, in the yellow. Uh, we also have conifer defoliation. This is very hard to tell from the air what these uh, uh, moths or budworms are defoliating. Um, it's oftentimes Douglas fir or subalpine fir, and from the air, it's very hard to differentiate those two. Um, you've got some Douglas fir beetle in patches. My laser knows it's the end of the semester. <laughs> it's not wanting to work anymore. Um, so <laughs> Douglas fir beetle, as you're coming up and down the canyon, you've probably noticed, um, and it's patchy here on the hillside above Telluride. Um, spruce beetle, you haven't really had a whole lot of spruce beetle in your area yet, and it's very uncertain as to um, if it will ever make it here. I mean, it's in this area, but it, will it ever explode kind of to the uh, high severity extent, extensive nature um, that it has elsewhere in the San Juans? The landscape is more dissected. I think you have um, more broken up patches and younger patches, um, which could really change the dynamic of that. There's also western balsam bark beetle, which is hitting um, subalpine fir. So a lot of this decline up here in the, uh, in the spruce fir kind of zone um, is going to be associated with uh, a subalpine fir decline. Um, and then there's some mountain pine beetle and ponderosa pine um, that's been detected in this area. So you've got a lot going on. Um, it's not kind of, you, you don't have any wholesale kind of uh, death and destruction that we see across a lot of the state. Um, you've been very fortunate in terms of avoiding um, really high severity extensive outbreaks that take out any particular species on your landscape. Even though I know this looks like a lot of change, um, drive around the rest of the state and it looks like not much has happened here. So now let me show you some of these tabs. We've got Aspen, Douglas fir, Ponderosa pine, um, spruce fir, and then we'll talk about virus. But these are the, the uh, <coughs> projections tabs. Remember, <coughs> these are based on Jim Worrell's projections. Um, so we're looking out to about mid-century for these projections as to where these species will be. And uh, Heather has come up with this really cool little way where we can slide this bar to the right um, and we can look at kind of this uh, where this species is today. So the present day distribution, this is for aspen, all this bright green um, is aspen cover. And then as we move it to the west, left, you can see um, this is for mid-century. This is our, our rating. Um, and this is taking into account these projections that Jim World did. And then we modeled topo climate. So how the topography influences and interacts with sun angles to make um, a south-facing or south-southwest-facing steep slope over in here, how that exacerbates the heat on that slope and for that species in terms of moisture stress much more um, than it would on a north-facing slope. So it's really stressing your topography. We also modeled hydrology on your landscape, so how water moves and pools on your landscape to get an idea of um, where you'll, you have wetter places on your landscape versus drier places on your landscape. And we created this um, composite kind of topo climate map that then we interfaced with Jim World's projections. Um, in the case of Aspen, we also looked at recent decline. Um, so this is, goes into a big GIS weighting scheme. Um, and recent decline was equally weighted with topo climate and the projection that Jim World did. Um, and we made the assumption that 
if the if this if Aspen has already experienced decline from the early part of the century um, based on that drought and we're anticipating many more of those types of droughts and maybe even that becomes our, our average condition by the 2030s or 2040s um, that that's indicative that there's something about that site the soil holding capacity um, the aspect there's something about that site that may make it less um, favorable for Aspen to stay there so they were bumped down in our in our ranking um, if they had significant recent <coughs> decline, which if you recall, we had a lot of significant recent decline in this area. Um, so this is the projection for, for mid-century, um, and we rated these as uh, high. So this is these green areas. Um, it's there today. We anticipate that it will be there um, by mid-century, that those are still um, good sites for Aspen. This kind of orangish color here, um, this is our, our low-medium kind of category. Um, we're, we're just not certain if Aspen will be able to persist there. And then these low category areas um, are suggesting that the, the uh, topography, hydrology, <coughs> projection, and recent decline are indicating um, that, it's, that it's pretty unlikely that Aspen will be there. One note about Aspen that, um, that uh, we, we need to make that's different than the other species I have a hard time betting against a species um, that loves fire, okay? Um, we are moving towards a, a future with more fire. Um, that's what all the projections would suggest. A species that can regenerate, that can re-sprout following fire. Um, I, I have a hard time betting against it. So um, how this will all play out, we will see. Um, but uh, I have a hard time believing that, uh, that Aspen's going to to um, be wiped out from the landscape. Nonetheless, um, this is suggesting that, uh, you know, somewhere around 50-60% uh, of your current Aspen um, distribution by mid-century is, is threatened. So Douglas fir will do the same thing. Remember, Douglas fir is a uh, drought and heat adapted, very plastic species. Right now, you've got it hanging on in these drainages here and in the canyon. Um, there's also quite a bit of it in these kind of drainage, in this drainage going up Leopard Creek here. Um, there's a little bit above town. There's some scattered here and there in this area. And as we go towards uh, mid-century, uh, we anticipate that it's going to, you know, just as we anticipated in, the, in my intro, that it will expand out on the landscape. Um, we don't have a whole lot of places where it's high other than these kind of steep north-facing higher elevation sites in, in, uh, in these areas where it already exists, that it will be high there. Um, we actually categorize this a little bit different than Aspen because um, a lot of it seemed to be uh, a pretty rosy picture. Um, so this medium kind of um, anticipation of where it will be, a lot of north aspects here. Um, we anticipate that it will be able to expand to. Um, and then low medium, it could actually expand up into some places where there's aspen and spruce fir today. Um, and then very little kind of low um, other than down much lower elevation and down valley here. Um, once again, this is a projection. The seed has to get there, it has to germinate. We have to have enough seed as we speak um, you're losing a lot of your Douglas fir, although Todd and the Forest Service has been treating a lot of it to keep it safe from um, <coughs> Doug fir beetle. But as you're losing your higher elevation seed sources, this is of great concern. Because those higher elevation seed sources, those are the ones, they're on what's called the leading edge. Those are the ones that are going to throw seeds out the furthest in terms of up into these landscapes. So um, this is a, a projection of where it could exist. If it actually gets there in time, germinates, if we have seed sources, et cetera, um, those are very different questions. We don't actually know a whole lot about how far a lot of these seeds travel. Um, Ponderosa pine, the general thinking is um, about 50 to 100 meters is how far the seed travels, um, but there haven't been a whole lot of studies on that, and we're just now trying to, starting to figure out that um, rodents move these things around a lot more than we anticipated. So here's the, uh, the current distribution of ponderosa pine. Not a whole lot patchy in here, um, but we get more ponderosa pine as we get into this area. 
and here is the projection into the future. Remember, uh, this is a species that is drought and heat adapted. It's also fire adapted instead of re-sprouting. Um, its fire adaptation is to have thick bark <coughs> to be able to resist fire. Of course, it needs to get to be um, 40, 50, 60 years old before that bark is thick enough that it can resist fire. But nonetheless, um, a projection of, yeah, it could expand out onto the landscape. Um, we don't have a whole lot of high um, confidence that it will expand out in these areas. Um, and I'm not sure exactly why that is. It could be um, some of the initial modeling and some of the initial kind of understanding of the distribution of the species on the landscape. Um, the other factor could be that we don't have as much topographic complexity in this area um, that are really creating cooler, wetter sites um, and or pooling of, of a lot of water and the hydrology in that area as much as there is um, in these steeper kind of areas. We look at spruce and fir, which combined, remember, with aspen is the other um, dominant species on your landscape. We can look at present day uh, distribution. And remember, uh, there's a lot of debate as to if this will be able to move up into what is currently the alpine zone. And here's the projection for the future. <coughs> Not so great. Um, yeah, so it's going to really, you know, we anticipate that it would be um, really constricted in its, in its range. Um, spruce and fir, in particular subalpine fir, just does not have much of an ability to shut down during a drought and, and kind of go dormant like uh, Douglas fir or ponderosa pine can. Um, so they just keep trying to draw water up from their roots even if there isn't water. Um, and uh, that actually cavitates their structure and um, they die, they might take them a couple years to die, but um, that's the general process during drought. So even without a fire or a beetle outbreak, um, <coughs> they can die off as a result of that. Any questions on the models real quick before I show the fire risk tab? I just want to add a big plug for Heather Woodland, who works for the county, who yeah. I forgot to thank. I'm not sure why, because I just spent the last week with her working on these maps. But uh, she was able to participate in all of our meetings and then translate that into a um, site that she discovered that would help you know, tell the stories of these maps. So she's been plugging away on these for some time now and is a huge player on this. Yeah, project. so the, the process was sending Heather a lot of stuff, <coughs> and then she does this cool slide and makes it. It is really cool. It is pretty cool, yeah. yeah. Nice work, Heather. Okay. Scary. Yeah. <laughs> so on the fire risk layer, um, we decided, we, we talked about a handful of ways that we can look at this. Um, there are a lot of ways that you can that you can look at fire in the landscape. You can um, you can actually model how fire would spread on the landscape <coughs> given different ignitions and different wind conditions and all sorts of things. Um, fire ignitions are a very stochastic process on the landscape. If it's lightning or kids playing with matches or um, a catalytic converter or whatever it is, we just have a hard time understanding where or when um, fire might. Uh, uh, um, be ignited and then um, all of the different potential combinations of conditions of wind and topography and things um, come into play that it just kind of makes more sense to say um, where do you have the potential for high fire intensity in different distances from um, areas where you have a lot of people and a lot of structure, so a lot of value. Um, so what we did was we used these existing sources once again. Um, by the way, these, these gray perimeters are showing um, some of your recent fire events. Um, I think this is Alta Lakes, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so some fire, not, you know, once again, not a, a West Fork kind of a situation or something, but um, some fire in your landscape recently. Um, so these are, these are areas in the red where we would, uh, where it's been modeled that you have the potential for f high fire intensity, um, which we are interpreting or can generally be interpreted as um, you also have the potential for fast spread rates, um, long flame lengths. In other words, 
um, a challenge in terms of getting away from it quickly, evacuating people, and or a challenge to fight, and or something that it wouldn't be reasonable for the Forest Service to say, yeah, we're going to put people um, in the way of that with some garden hoses and big hoses and shovels and what have you, um, and helicopters that they could actually do something. So these are highlight lighting areas where we have um, resources, people, structures, as well as the potential for um, high fire intensity um, on the landscape. And I don't think uh, every time we've kind of looked at this after we've looked at the broader landscape, there are probably too many surprises for most of the people in this room in terms of um, where people are, where structures are. Um, and there's, in general, you have a lot of fuel on your landscape. Um, so a lot of potential hazards out there. That's the website. Uh, do you want me to talk about potential next steps, or should we wait for the panel to? Um, yeah, let's let's uh, let's go to the panel. Okay. And um, do you want to just talk really quickly about where um, this information came from? Uh, I mean, one of the things that I found so helpful about this process is that. This information was all out there in a series of published reports and maps that were only available to those of us who attend meetings all the time, and um, and they're you know a, a series of large maps that are that are hard to translate. And this is one of the things we heard from West Region Wildfire Council, who works a lot in the State Forest Service, is that we have this huge report and it's really informative, but translating that to people to actually take action or be informed has been our biggest challenge. And this is a lot of state and federal funds, millions and millions of dollars that have gone into these reports. So one of the goals here was to simplify it and add a layer to it of modeling and um, make it easily accessible to the general public so we could have access to this information that our taxpayer dollars have gone to pay for. Yeah, for fire, there is a wealth of information, if it's maps, if it's knowledge of individuals, there is a lot of information for your area. Yeah. So this was, yeah. There, and there are a lot of different ways that you can pull up this information and look at it, and it all basically tells you the same story, that, um, you know, where, where you have fuels and um, people on the landscape, there's potential for, for some some bad outcomes, so, yeah, there's a lot of information, knowledgeable people, yeah. But hopefully this starts a discussion where you can leverage those people and their knowledge. Speaking of those knowledgeable people, should we? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Not including myself, the other knowledgeable people that are on the panel. <coughs> Do we want to keep this up to look at any maps, or? Uh, maybe yeah. switch back to one of the other. <laughs> to one of the, the pretty green one. <laughs> okay, where everything's alive. It's <laughs> really pretty and green. <laughs> All right. Um, so for those of you who haven't had a chance to meet um, Todd and Austin yet, um, from the Forest Service, we have Todd Gardner and Austin from the Colorado State Forest Service. Um, so we want to take this opportunity to have a panel discussion <coughs> on how we, we have this great resource, you know, how can we start to use it, um, and what are the potential next steps that we can take um, based off this information. And absolutely throughout this um, panel discussion, um, if you have questions or comments, feel free to um, throw those out there. Um, so yeah, let's start off with... Um, kind of along that same theme. So we have this information now, um, and as the community uses this resource, what um, what kinds of, you know, if, if the community goes in the direction of um, active forest treatments, what kind of projects, activities are there to consider? Um, and if there are any particulars that are well suited to our upper San Miguel Basin? Um, and in terms of active forest management, you know, we, we can also go in the other direction. We can choose areas on the landscape that we don't want to see active management and we want to see 
what happens, what the landscape does, um, you know, what what can we learn from nature? But obviously, you know, if we switch back to that fire map, um, I think as uh, now as an elected official, I feel somewhat responsible for partnering and actually looking at what we can do. Maybe not not only for the people and structures there, but the people who would be expected to go in and protect those people and structures. I was thinking about, you know, my, my students who go off in the spring and go, you know, for the summertime to go fight wildfires to pay for the next you know, tuition. And um, I think we have to have reasonable expectations of what can, what the Forest Service can do, what we should expect them to do. So, could you re repeat the exact question yeah. one more time? Yeah, <laughs> so, um, so what kind of, uh, what kind of projects um, are the uh, federal and state entities, you know, currently involved in? What sort of options would this community have um, sure. if they were to pursue forest treatments? Maybe, maybe it would help if we broke out a little bit about what we do with our agency and then how the community can possibly engage us in that. So, <clears throat> I am a, the Assistant District Forester with the State Forest Service. I'm also the uh, Good Neighbor Authority Forester um, with uh, the Uray Ranger District and the Norwood Ranger District. Um, the State Forest Service, we kind of run the gamut of land management. So if you're a private landowner and you have you know, questions or concerns uh, about your forest, you can contact us and you'll get an actual forester to come out to your house to, discuss you know, whatever it is you have a question about. Um, as far as fire, fire seems to be a, a, a hot topic, if you will. Um, you, know, you can also call the State Forest Service um, to discuss fire matters. We work closely with the West Region Wildfire Council. Um, and when you call up the State Forest Service or the West Region Wildfire Council, you can request a, a site visit. Again, you can, we'll, we'll come out and uh, we'll talk about your <coughs> specific fire risk. Um, a little bit more to fire risk, um, they alluded to a little bit more specific efforts that are available to uh, residents of San Miguel County. Um, the West Region, I'll give a little plug for the West Region Wildfire Council. I sit on their steering committee and a few of them could not make it tonight. But a lot of, for everyone, John, tell me if I'm wrong, but they did a parcel level risk assessment. For everyone in the county, they went out and they looked at specific parcels and rated those parcels to 11 factors with fire. And I don't know if anyone, you should have received a mailing which has a unique code on it that you can type in and go to cowildfire.org. Mm -hmm. That's the West Region Wildfire Council's uh, website. And that's a tool that we, we really want landowners to take advantage of. Um, it's going to tell you specifically about your parcel, um, and then you know the that call to action, if we, if you will, what we want, we would like to see come from that, is to get boots on the ground out there with you. Uh, so you know, a fire expert, a forestry expert. Oftentimes, you may be prompted to call the West Region Wildfire Council, uh, maybe for, for for recommendations with wildfire, but since the State Forest Service does those site visits with them, it's just inevitable that we end up talking about beetles and fire and, and a lot of these, these things that uh, we've been talking about tonight. So um, as far as projects that are happening, uh, my world as a, as a forester for the State Forest Service has shrunk a little bit. <coughs> my, my job focus has uh, switched a little bit more to working with our federal partners. Um, if you're a private landowner and you abut U.S. Forest Service um, in this area, and you say, hey, you know, we've got fire concern over there, and you're, you're, you're pointing across the fence, well, you know, you can still work with, with the U.S. Forest Service and the State Forest Service to address that fire risk across the fence. Um, and that's kind of how my, my job, my personal job, is changing a little bit to work with private landowners um, as well as U.S. Forest Service. Talk sure. about what you do and how the public yeah. might be So, working with the U.S. Forest Service, we primarily manage federal lands, although we work real closely with the state, with the counties, with the municipalities to try and do some collaborative work. 
across the boundaries. Um, I would advocate zeroing in on the wildland urban interface in those areas that showed up on that fire risk map and starting there. It's a huge forest, it's a huge landscape. We can really only impact small pieces of it with um, active management <coughs> that we're doing. Um, up in this area, we're working with the Telluride ski area as part of our um, spruce beetle environmental impact statement we're doing. We have work planned over the next 10 years to continue to thin out some of the stands up there in between the ski runs. Um, that's about the best fuel break you have in the spruce road for all the ski runs. And then if we can thin out all the stands in between those ski runs and keep them in the best health we can, um, that's a good place to go. Um, if you, as you move across the landscape, um, we've got another project over towards the Little Cone. And probably our biggest opportunity to do larger scale work is over towards Lone Cone and Beaver Park over south of Norwood. Um, we do have large landscape level projects going on the Forest Service lands. Uh, the Uncompagre Plateau, we've had a 10 year collaborative forest restoration program going. We're in year nine of 10, and we're doing some lots of work up there and really trying to shift the composition and structure of those forests. And I would invite you all to get involved with that. We're gonna have a meeting, our annual meeting in Montrose on February 13th. Uh, the other thing the forest is doing is the big SPEEDMER acronym, Spruce Beetle Epidemic Aspen Decline Management Response. <laughs> Basically, what are we doing about spruce beetle and aspen on the landscape? But one thing I'll point out about that, it's not all about salvaging dead trees. We're doing stuff out there. We're actively getting um, into forests where the beetles haven't done a lot of damage and trying to put those forests in a structure where they're not as attractive to the beetle. And I spent a lot of time out in the woods, and I'll tell you, the timber harvest that's happened in our spruce fir back in the 80s and 90s is paying dividends, because those are the stands that are looking pretty good right now in the face of a lot of beetle pressure. Yeah, and so um, going off those ideas, and what Jason talked about earlier about um, the species migration and um, potentially certain species moving up on the landscape. Um, what are what are some opportunities to promote that kind of migration? <laughs> I love that Douglas fir map, and I wish it to be true. <laughs> I'm really skeptical because I've watched Douglas fir get his butt kicked on this landscape for the last 15 years, and it's continuing to happen, but I really hope that <laughs> it pans out. Um, some things that, that we're starting to try is in in some spruce fir, like mixed conifer spruce fir aspen stands, doing some group selection and patch cuts, and then looking to go back in and plant ponderosa pine and Douglas fir in stands where we had Engelmann spruce and subalpine fir growing in the past. So trying to spread these species out on the landscape a little bit. Um, it's, it's just a drop in the bucket, but. Yeah, a lot, of, a lot of the aspen slide is what gets a lot of people excited. That's we come here for, we live here for the colors, um, and the, the future of that aspen was, uh, on, on that particular slide, seemed to be you know, kind of in question. And a lot of that aspen is on private land. That's where we work. So, um, you know, aspen's a, it's kind of finicky, but like Jason said, it could also save us in some ways. Um, but aspen, <coughs> you know, the problem the, or the challenge with managing aspen on private land one of those things is how fragmented it is. And in a lot of instances where we might want to, you know, look at doing some aspen regeneration, you need a large scale, a lot of aspen to do it. So what we typically find, you know, in the, say, Alvazaro area, somebody will call on their lot and say, hey, we're losing our aspen due to decline. And, um, you know, that's just kind of a tough situation to be in. So um, I would say for <coughs> private landowners on, say PC Mesa, start talking to your, um, your neighbors about managing aspen you know, at a larger scale. Um, aspen, you, and you want to work with a forester on that. You know, you, you've heard that fire and cutting can regenerate aspen. Like I said, it's very finicky. You want to look at is there a presence of canker, look at the existing regeneration, look at the site, the soil characteristics, um, the aspect. So, 
Um, you know, I would say, you know, plug the State Forest Service working with private landowners. There's a lot, there's a lot of private land and a lot of aspen in that study area. I'd also give a little plug for our the State Forest Service uh, seedling tree program. So that can kind of work out good to plant trees where it's getting warmer and where the, the say spruce and fir might be moving away. I think that's one of the things that we should really look at as a community. And um, Towski really paved the way for this. Chris Hayes in, in the back room was a leader in this effort of when they were forced to do the wetlands mitigation, they created their own nursery so they could have all localized plants from um, you know, local sources. So they weren't bringing plants in from Walmart and you know, Home Depot and wherever else people go out to the public places and get plants that were foreign to this area. They were creating their own seed stock based on local efforts. Um, we've got a very small, <coughs> Uh, thanks to Telluride and, and San Miguel County monitoring effort going on at Bear Creek right now. And as we were installing those plots in one of the plots, we found a 500, 600 year old um, Doug for like 600 year old Doug for basically a bonsai Doug for a, a Lance is telling me to shut up back there. <laughs> I won't tell you where it is. It's okay, really, really hard to find. <laughs> no one's allowed to go in Bear Creek anymore. But, uh, you know, there are species that have adapted to this region, and we should start looking at saving those species and partnering with the Forest Service and, and CSU and um, making sure that we have seed stock for this region in the future. Our, our seedling tree program, I think, is being underutilized. You, we can also work with uh, extension on ordering trees. So, um, yeah, let's start planting trees. Yeah, I'd also say, you know, we, the scientific community says there's a lot of uncertainty out there, and we should be cutting down on uncertainty. And one of the ways we can cut down on uncertainty is to treat every single thing that we do, if it's a private landowner or um, the county or the town or, or Forest Service, um, whatever we do on whatever scale we do it, we should treat it as an experiment. Things are changing very quickly. These things, these changes are, are superimposed upon um, you know, 150 years of, at times, very intensive um, use of this landscape. We don't know how things are going to play out. And the more information we can gather in these kind of initial um, hits from climate change, the better off we're going to be to help you guys make decisions and, and help this landscape adapt to um, uh, kind of our current and future climate reality. So any of these things, you know, Hillary's saying, hey, let's conserve our local seed source. So the, the, the biogeographical theory would say, hey, that Doug fir in Bear Creek or the handful of ponderosa pine that you have over here above town, um, they're here. There's not a lot of them here. There could be something genetically unique about those. Yeah, maybe they aren't. Maybe they're genetically identical to a few valleys over, but there could be something unique about them that make them well adapted to this valley, to the soils, to whatever it is about this valley. So, um, you know, just to be uh, uh, cautious about, you know, seed sources, if we bring in other seed sources, we should treat those as an experiment and say, okay, we're, you know, because you guys can get seeds from different zones. Um, you know, if we can monitor, if you're going to have a big project to plant, you know, to, to actually facilitate migration. So this is a huge debate in the scientific community and among um, people who do environmental ethics. Should we be moving species upslope? Um, or should we be picking the winners and losers? Or should we just pave the way potentially? So at this point in time, Picking County is saying, let's use ecological disturbance theory. Let's open up patches. Let's see if we can facilitate migration without physically picking the winners and losers. So either through fire or through patch cuts, can we facilitate things and see what happens? So we have some patch cuts on the edge of some high elevation Douglas fir, for example. <coughs> they haven't expanded so far. They haven't done anything for a few years. Um, but we're going to monitor that and see. It's all an experiment. The other thing that you can do is you can say, hey, you know, we just don't believe that, the, that these systems can track climate, that these species will be able to migrate fast enough. 
Um, let's start experimenting with different seed zones with the, with the state forest service, U.S. forest service. Um, let's plan a mix if it's private <coughs> land or public, public land. Let's monitor these um, and see which seed type does well. We can collect some local seed and throw it in there potentially. So treat everything as an experiment. Um, don't pick the winners and losers would be a logical thing because we just don't know. Is it a seed source from low, lower elevation that's better adapted to heat and drought? Um, or is it your local seed source, which is somehow potentially um, better adapted to your local environment? So we should be treating all these things, whatever we do, as an experiment. And the other big thing is we need to keep places like Bear Creek and some other places on the landscape where we do nothing. Because while you, we may, and there are a lot of ecologists who say, species won't be able to track climate. We're going to lose a lot of habitat. Um, and the implications for all of the cascading implications for um, other plants and animals um, are too great that we <coughs> absolutely have to facilitate migration or else we're going to lose too much of our forest cover um, connectivity, all these other issues. You know, if we start to layer all of these things together, you can very easily see that we could have a Swiss cheesy kind of landscape by mid-century with you know, fragmented patches and no large patches, you know, kind of a, a death sentence for something like lynx that we would value, um, or even migratory pathways for other species that are abundant today may <coughs> start to have more problems. So we absolutely have to keep places like Bear Creek, because maybe Mother Nature, maybe the natural system can keep up. Maybe we need that reference condition to see how it's adapting, which seeds are adapting, which species, how things are playing out. Um, we can't even anticipate that spruce and fir will stay together. Maybe we're going to see the emergence of Douglas fir with Engelmann spruce, which I saw some weird mixes of in, in the Canadian Rockies this summer. So there could be all kinds of surprises. So um, we need to keep some reference locations on the landscape intact that we're not messing with. And anything else we do, we need to truly treat it as an experiment and monitor it and follow it to see how it's playing out. One of the opportunities we had through uh, Speedmer as well, I will be on the record as saying I strongly oppose Speedmer <laughs> in the beginning of its process, but throughout the evolution of that group coming together and trying to come up with <coughs> a compromised 10-year landscape project, 